and what what what's going through my head is is that right now we have this almost I want to call it a contempt, um, but maybe it is a contempt for being at home, right? If you talk about the stay-at-home mom, uh, there are uh, modes of thought. There are camps out there that would denigrate that way of life because it's seen as being oppressive or um, it's, it's just simply less than mm-hmm. uh, a wife, mother, or just a woman uh, going into the workforce and making whatever contribution she's capable of making. Um, the same thing and probably even worse uh, conception of the stay-at-home dad, right? Even though we're trying to break down those gender barriers, I think the stay-at-home dad is probably looked at even worse uh, in modern society than the, the stay-at-home mom. And, and this is me spitballing here. I'm not I haven't seen numbers or anything like that to back up my my kind of intuition as far as how people are perceived, but this is what I hear. Um, and because of that, being at home is not necessarily looked at as being appropriate in modern Western or modern American culture. Um, True. And so I'm not sure if going and teaching the kids about gardening and things like that is the best first step so much as just trying to let people know that it's okay to be home. It's okay to be uh, a family. It's okay to, um, Mm -hmm. right? I I think that's one of the reasons that people don't want to be at home and you have to be at home in order to do something there, to garden or to do things like that. Right. Um, yeah. It's, you know, my con- it's like, you know, I'd rather in, until we could work at home. That's the one condition under which people feel I and actually it doesn't. Feel right. So, but, you know, well, and, and COVID shown us that. Right. People there were people who found a lot more joy in working at home, being forced to be home because they rekindled. They created these relationships with their kids and with their spouses that was not possible because everybody was gone, Mm -hmm. right? Now, there's obviously examples going the complete opposite direction where people's lives fell apart, either economically or because they just didn't have the uh, emotional maturity to be around their family so much. Um, And maybe emotional maturity is too judgmental. But, uh, you know, there are cases on both sides of that. But I think by and large, people realize, you know, I kind of like being around my kids. They're, they're more interesting than the little bit of time I give them yeah. uh, has otherwise led on. And I, I think that, I mean, my conception of agrarianism is also kind of evolving as I get more and more into reading things and whatnot. And it wasn't until fairly recently that I realized just how important the family or the idea of family is to an agrarian way of life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're talking about distributism, but it's very closely akin in my mind to agrarianism and, and, and they go well together. Um, but agrarian, uh, an agrarian lifestyle, the type that would uh, be encouraged if some sort of a distribution of property were to come out, really relied on having not just mom, dad, kids, or however the family structure was, but also extended family either close by or there on the same property. Mm -hmm. Um, And that when that was the case, uh, it functioned far better than any of our agriculture does today, at least from the social standpoint, right? We can put out boatloads of corn and soy here in Kansas, but go ask somebody growing it, you know, where their closest neighbor is. And some of them just don't even have neighbors because the farms are so big. all these small towns destroyed, basically. I did some interviews of um, people who were, you know, children and young adults on farms back in the 40s, mm-hmm. so or 30s and 40s. And, you know, so I guess I'm, I'm just saying there are people who are alive today who still remember that previous right. way of life. They described to me this, exactly what you're talking about, extended family, people close by, 
Um, people would come to their aid if they had a problem or like during harvest time, they'd all kind of like team up together and go from farm to farm and mm -hmm. this type of stuff. There was just a great deal of cooperation. And as I was interviewing them, I was thinking to myself, if, if you describe this in, different, in a different context, a lot of Americans would think you were talking about communism instead of right. wholesome small town America from the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. And with it's been, it's happened so quickly. That's, it's yeah. scary, you know, like within just a few decades, really, uh, no more than, you know, a quarter, three quarters of a century, we go from that to, you know, no level of cooperation. And, right. you know, just you look at the countryside, it's a completely different scene where all these towns are gone. You know, people are leaving in droves because the, they can't be supported on these giant farms. It's just so stark. Well, the communities that have survived that, they've only survived because uh, they're close enough to an urban center or they invested in broadband in order for people to have second homes out there. You mm -hmm. know, wanting to be back in the more rural area for the aesthetic rather than for the community. Um, which that's a whole different thing, but yeah, I hear there's a lot. Sad. I hear there's a lot of Californians coming our way, actually. So they're you are going everywhere. <laughs> the Midwest is starting to look pretty good right now. So, <laughs> um, but I wanted to make sure that that I talk to you about permaculture and how permaculture might fit into this scene that you know we're we're imagining here if 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 we had government's cooperation to distribute the land and give people enough education and we had enough people willing to do it okay uh, but we have people who are maybe not as able to do the good mm -hmm. old traditional agriculture and besides it isn't the smartest way to grow things like could permaculture kind of solve some of those problems or, or make the scenario more likely? Because to me, I mean, yes, permaculture requires work, but you know, the, the, the big concept of perm permaculture is that you've got things growing around you that don't need an excessive amount of work and just keep coming back year after year. So the labor of maintaining a permaculture, I would think would be less than at least small scale diversified farming. So I've actually been trying to think about this since, uh, you know, on your website, you've got the, the page about the Institute, um, say the name for me, that includes- oh, the Institute of Perma Social and Permaculture Research. That, that may be changing, but Social and Permaculture Research, yes. Right. So when I was seeing that, I was thinking to myself, so I mean, one thing that I've had in mind for quite a long time was it would be really nice to have, you know, a think tank focused on these agrarian ideals and, uh, you know, the, the related ideas and whatnot. Um, so I, permaculture is an interesting case study. Um, I've done a permaculture design course. I've taken a course on permaculture uh, research design, permaculture teacher training. Uh, in fact, this weekend, we're teaching a uh, permaculture design course at the student farm at K-State. Uh, wow. It's our second of three weekends um, for our summer 2021 class. Um, and so permaculture is something that I, I've embraced. I think a lot of people just don't understand what permaculture is. Um, permaculture is a design system. It's an ethical design system based on three ethics. And those ethics are care of the earth uh, or what people would consider to be uh, ecological care, that ecological leg of the three-legged stool of sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, and then care of people, so the social leg of sustainability. Uh, and then the last one, depending on who you talk to, it gets packaged in several different ways. Uh, some people call it fair share. Some people call it redistribution of surplus. I've heard a couple of other different ways of saying it, but ultimately that third leg is ensuring that whatever is produced by your system uh, is not wasted and that it's distributed where it needs to be. That could be to the refrigerator in your house. That could be to letting uh, wild animals take a bit of it. That could be to uh, sharing it with your neighbors or selling it at a farmer's market or any of those things that would distribute the excess, right? In order to um, ensure that you're supporting not just the system 
in that spot, but the broader system, the, 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 the bigger ecosystem. And those ethics can be applied. I mean, most people associate their application to landscape um, design with a food production uh, element associated. Um, but permaculturists will tell you that that can be applied anywhere. If you use those ethics uh, as your, your, me your measuring stick in developing a curriculum for a, a class, if you use those for uh, coming up with a business plan or uh, community planning type things, uh, permaculture, those ethics can apply anywhere. And really, they just mirror the idea of sustainability um, addressing the ecological, economic, and social aspects of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that regard, I think that permaculture can absolutely address um, most of the problems that are faced in the world today. Uh, maybe not all, but most. Um, and if we, if we really wanted to get down to, to it, we could probably figure out how it could solve all of our problems. Now, that's what permaculture is. Um, I think that permaculture has all of that potential, but it's somewhat stymied by uh, the people who embrace it. And, and this is probably going to get me uh, tarred and feathered in some circles, but I the reality is, is that- I think I get it already, so try to relax about that. <laughs> <laughs> The reality is, is that permaculturists are not exempt from being as dogmatic as anybody else. And mm -hmm. so um, when I hear a permaculturist say, oh, well, we can solve all the world's problems with it. I, I, the first thought that goes through my head is, yeah, but not without a lot of people buying in and not without a lot of conversation. And it's not just going to fix everything right. um, and not right at once. And um yeah, our problems are bigger than, than that particular statement. And I mean, there's other places where permaculturists get dogmatic. I mean, there's camps that say key line plows versus swales, and it's funny to watch those arguments uh -huh. go on. Uh, but the reality is, is there is potential there um, for addressing most of the underlying problems that we have, not just you know on the broad scale, but mostly and, and where it's going to have its most impact is on the very local scale. Um, and so in that regard, you asked about how could permaculture play into this idea of you know, dis distribution of land and then people knowing what to do with it. Yeah. And if we were to um, incorporate permaculture design into that distribution, I think that there's a lot more potential where I said that uh, we don't have the education or the knowledge has been lost in how to live that homestead type of life and, mm -hmm. and be more self-sufficient. Um, a lot of the people who are trying to implement permaculture landscapes, those landscapes that are built on mimicking natural systems and uh, relying heavily on perennial plants that mm -hmm. work together to uh, create an ecosystem that is functional while at the same time providing things that people can use, food primarily, uh, but other products and other services that that, that system can, can provide. If you were to marry a distribution or distributist uh, philosophy with permaculture, for those people who don't know how to go out there and plant the annual plants that most of us eat, right? The tomatoes, the peppers, the potatoes, the wheat, all of that kind of stuff, having a perennial system can look a lot easier to manage because perennials tend to be, well, one, they're, they're longer lived by nature. Uh, they tend to be hardier against things like late freezes, early freezes, heat spells, drought, um, and all of those things, they, they're just more resilient plants by nature. Um, and if your system is set up correctly, they can be a lot lower maintenance. And so for those people who don't have the ability to get out and till and weed and water and all of those things on a very regular basis, it's a much, it has the potential to be a much lower maintenance system, right? And I think that that's, that's a very positive thing. 
The downside to that is if you're focused on self-sufficiency, a system that is very perennial is going to look very different than what 99.9% .9 of Americans are used to. You're not going to have tomatoes in the fridge or tomatoes should be on the counter, by the way. Uh, you're not going to have tomatoes <laughs> in the larder uh, around the, you know, around the entire calendar. It's just, they're going to be there here. What? They're going to be there from late June, early July through October, maybe into November. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the year, you're not eating tomatoes unless you've canned them. Right? And there's a whole nother skill set that we'd have to reintroduce to people as food preservation. Wow. And, 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 you know, grains, at least the grains that were, that are available to us now, um, they're almost entirely annuals. Um, mm -hmm. There's one permaculturist in Wisconsin that argues that chestnuts could probably replace a lot of the uses that we put wheat to. And that I, I haven't looked deep enough into it, but it sounds intriguing. The reality is, is that nobody knows what to do with a chestnut to use it as you would wheat, right? <laughs> and, and so what I'm saying is, is that it, it has a lot of promise. And insofar as I said that at least everybody should grow something, it would satisfy that hands down. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would look very different than what people are used to now. And as a result, I think it would be a lot harder to swallow uh, wholesale right? We're already doing it piecemeal. When people get interested in doing it, they're going to go do it. And so right. there's a subset of the population that's already doing it and adjusting. Uh, but to make it a, a larger, more broad uh, switch would take some time and a lot of education. And what do I do with these things that I, you know? Yeah, right. Because we've, we've destroyed our cuisines that are based upon naturally what what grows in your immediate area and what thrives we've lost that. Yeah. yeah so so i mean for the most we've homogenized part, our diet exactly right they don't learn a cuisine there is no cuisine and um so yeah it would almost it would have to be reinvented i have a lot of permaculture stuff on my property and i'm starting to use it instead of gardening as much on a you know on an annual annual basis and just some of the stuff i have had to get used to I have sorrel, bloody dock. I've got Italian dandelions. I think they might be annual. I don't like them very much, but I'm figuring out how to eat them. Um, <laughs> I've got walking onions. I've got a lot of different things like that, that on any given day I can go out, I can get some I, raspberries and stuff like that. Um, you know, I can't feed myself on that, but I mean, I guess the point to make is like, I have figured out what to do with that stuff. I've just kind of forced myself. Right. This is, um, you know, it's an abomination to have a, a tomato that you can, you know, have access to buying 12 months out of the year. Have you tasted that? That looks perfect, tomatoes? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny that you say that. There's the, the first GM, the first genetically engineered product to hit the market was the flavor saver tomato back in the 80s. Oh and God. that flavor saver tomato was designed to be mechanically harvestable uh, as a fresh market tomato. We have tomatoes that can be mechanically harvested, but they all go into sauces. Okay. Um, and that's just because, you know, mechanical harvesters are not as careful as hands. And so uh, they tend to get damaged. And the only place you're going to sell a damaged tomato is in a can or a jar. So, um, that product hit the market and was almost immediately pulled back because it tasted like cardboard and nobody it was called the flavor saver <laughs> and it, it tasted sure like saved the flavor <laughs> yeah it wasn't a saver a flavor we're saving oh man yeah i heard about these um robots that they now have that can go through something like an orange grove or probably a tomato patch and literally right. the little hands figure out how to pick them up just like I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. I mean, from the distributist perspective, I, I mean, this is another thing that maybe you, you can weigh in on too. Like I've thought about what about the machinery? Is machinery necessarily bad? Is the use of really high tech bad? I tend to not, I don't think so. I think if you scale that high tech to the, to the local and to the, right. to the small, you know, what would be wrong with that? It's the fact that these machines put people out of work that's the that's the problematic nature of it. It's what they're it's yeah. the use that they're put to. Yeah, and it's the scale, right? So the land grant system, right? We work at K State, and K State's a land grant college. It was originally designed for 
the common man, the farmers and the mechanics of the world to get research-based information and to have education opportunities for their kids and for them uh, on how to improve their farming and how to improve their engineering and things like that. I mean, they were originally designed for farmers and mechanics, engineers, uh, in order to access real research-based information and to have the ability to get a liberal education was literally in there. A liberal education. Uh, and today what they evolved into is basically an arm of agribusiness where let's create the next chemical that we can spray onto the fields to you know, increase our, our margins by that half a percent or that one percent so that we can keep these big farmers. Uh, the cynic in me is about to come out. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Right, <laughs> so that we can keep these systems as efficient as possible. Um, and let's do that at the expense of rural communities, small farms, and the, the, um, the resiliency that that kind of um, diversity in systems offers, right? So we've completely gone away from this idea of diversity being useful for us. And in fact, one agricultural economist from a land grant university back in the 90s wrote a book called the end of farming in the american portfolio where he basically argued what's the point of us even farming in the united states when we can go and offshore that to to My some gosh. developing country where not only will it be produced cheaper uh, and hit the grocery store shelves at a lower price but it's also going to pay these workers there more money and then we here in america can focus on knowledge work and i was like you, you understand you're advocating for, first of all, eliminating your job, but also just, you know, what's going to happen to rural America if we get rid of farming? In one regard, it's probably a lot of it's going to go back wild, uh, but you're going to have a lot of people who are like, no, this is my way of life and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm willing to risk poverty in sure. order to stay here, right? Yeah, and, and it's yeah. just such a well, it, I mean, and it, it may make it, sense to economic economists, but it just doesn't make sense to humans. It only makes sense to economists, even in this sort of perfect void, this sort of theoretical void, you know, but like even economists surely know, like if you give all of that power to another country or set of countries, then now you've got a country that is so vulnerable. Right. You know, it's just a, just waiting for it's a national security like risk that is insane yeah yeah, yeah. like what do you say we can go for two weeks without food and that's probably if you you know are kind of well prepared ahead of time right right well i might be able to last a week or two longer than somebody else but <laughs> me too <laughs> but you know like we would eventually go and right. wouldn't it be perfect you know bio weapon to use right. so it just mystifies me why it's so, I mean, maybe I, I have a couple of guesses, but like why it's so hard for people to just wrap their heads around that, why they don't think about that question really first, like it's, you know, what's more important than your and your families and your community's survival? Right, why right. isn't, why isn't it always first? I mean, sort of my go-to answer is probably because capitalism has kind of like mesmerized people through consumerism in particular, you know, mm -hmm. um, we have all of these things now, right? We've got these little devices. I saw this picture of a, a guy with a table full of old equipment, like old electronics from the 1980s. And, and then it said on the caption below, you have all of these things in your pocket right now, right? And, and we can thank capitalism, right? For that, the ability to innovate at such a rapid pace. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what have we lost, right? So we've got all of these things in our pocket now but now we're not sitting outside with that boom box with a couple of our neighbor friends listening to music together. We've got earphones in and we're ignoring our neighbors. Right. And that's the trade-off. And But that's okay because our GDP is going up. And it can't go up forever. I mean, this is the other thing is we've reached this point where... <laughs> Tell where, an economist that. I don't know. Like it, it's, it's becoming an absolute threat to the environment. So you've got that, that, that at some well, we're point... We're going to mine asteroids and then we're going to oh. figure out how to oxygenate Mars and... <laughs> yeah, there's always some sort of... Uh, we'll, we'll seed the clouds and make it go away that way.